Okay, so this is what it says in James 1.22. It says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus as well said this, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and who obey it. And this morning, I just want to talk about listening to God and allowing God's word, not just listening, but actually putting it into practice, allowing God's word to sink deep in our hearts so it will take root, so that we can grow and so that we can flourish. The Bible says if we're just listeners, and if you're just here just to listen to something to pick you up and make you feel good and set you off for the week, but you're not doing anything with the word that is being spoken, the Bible says you're just being deceived. And you know, I want to talk, just share a quick little story about a family that I knew. I was sharing this at the Bible study uh, on Thursday night. But many, many years ago, about 10 years ago, if not longer, um, myself and Hammy would go and visit this family. And they were the nicest family you could ever meet. They were so loving and they always practiced hospitality and they would invite us into their home, make us cup of tea and biscuits and we would sit for hours talking about Jesus. We would sit for hours and they would sit there and they would intently listen and eat every word that was spoken. But they never actually responded to the message. They never, they listened but they never acted in faith and they never responded to the message. And what happened was the father of that house, he got very sick and he was rushed to hospital and um, he was given basically two to three weeks to live. And he's up in his hospital bed and he's dying, he's dying of cancer. And his daughter comes down and she sees Hammy at the hospital and she says, will you please come up and pray for my father? He hasn't got long left to live. So Hammy goes up and he goes up into the hospital room and there he is, the man who would listen, the man who say, yes, I believe, the man who ate every word that came from Hammy's mouth and he's there and he's dying and he's just about to go to eternity, so to speak, and Hammy says, can I pray for you? You need to get right with Jesus. That man turned his head and said no. He turned his head and he died without getting his heart right before the Lord. And then what happened was his other daughter, she got very sick and she had anorexic and her organs was failing and she ended up in hospital and she was on ice, in an ICU ward and the doctors had called the family up. She had hours to live. Now this is a true story. And so the other sister called Hammy and she said, the same sister that asked Hammy to pray for her father, rang Hammy and says, I know that if you go up to the hospital and you just lay hands on her, I know that she'll be healed. So me and Hammy goes up to the hospital, hours to live, and we prayed for her. And I'm telling you, not a word of a lie, that girl was raised from her deathbed. Now, she was kept in hospital because of anorexic. She had to build up her strength. But God took her off the ICU machines, the life support machines, and raised her up out of her sick bed and brought her into life. And so then what happened? The sister that asked Hammy to pray for the sister, she says, as, uh, as we were praying, she says, if she gets healed, sorry, before she got healed, she says, if she gets healed, she says, then I'll truly believe and give my heart to Jesus. And so I was sitting in the car with her and um, the presence of God was so strong. And I was talking about Jesus to her. Now remember, we're talking years to her. And I'm talking to her about Jesus and the presence of God is so strong. And I says, now is the time. Get right with Jesus. Give your heart to the Lord. Would she respond? No. What happened was she died. Not long after, she just, she just dropped dead. She was dead. And then what happened was that girl that was raised from her deathbed, did she give her heart to Jesus? No. And then what happened was the mother who, we had, who had listened and who gave us cups of tea and everything else like that, did she give her heart to Jesus? No. And then she died. 
Now that's a true story. There's only two of them left in that family and they still won't give up their sin to follow Jesus. And that's what I want to talk about. It's not enough to listen gladly and say, whoa, that's a great word. Oh, that makes me feel good. You need to respond to the message. You need to respond to the message. It's not enough to believe. All of these people, they all believed. They all says, oh yes, we believe. But even the demons believe and tremble at his name. It's not enough to know the Bible. The devil himself is the best theologian you will ever meet. He knows scriptures off by heart. It's not enough just to simply come here week in and week out and say, yes, I believe. Is there evidence of it in your life? Is there evidence, save and faith, is there evidence of it in your life? If you open up to the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, and this is what it says from verse 14. Now listen to this. Now King Herod heard of him, Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others says it is Elisha, and others says it is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod he heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded, he has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Hedoris, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, that's why he was put in prison. Therefore, Herodotus held it against him, that was Herod's wife, and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodotus, his daughter, came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went down and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked the king, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard it, they came, took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Now there's six Herods in the New Testament. It's like a title to a ruler. And this Herod is Herod Antipas. And he was son of Herod the Great. And if you remember the Christmas stories, Herod the Great uh, heard that there was going to be, the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, and he sent his army out to slaughter all the children, all males who were two years of age and under. And he was a wicked and very, very violent ruler. And he was out to kill Jesus from the word go. And so then he died, and he had ten wives, and... Obviously, there was many children. He had many children. And he gave his kingdom then to four of his sons. And he distributed it into four parts. And this king, or this ruler, Herod Antipas, he was actually the ruler of Galilee. Okay? He was the ruler of Galilee. And Jesus describes this man, Herod Antipas, as he's a fox. That's what Jesus called him. 
he says, Herod the fox. And why Jesus called him a fox was this. He was saying what he was saying was, and the people would have understood it, was that Herod was sneaky, he was lying, he was deceiving, he was dishonest, he was infected and a sick individual. Herod was driven by ambition and he had a lot of trauma in his life because of his father. He, he would have grown up with a lot of violence, a lot of abuse and a lot of fear. And we know when you read about Herod Antipas that he was an extremely selfish man to the core. And what happened was he was married um, to this woman and he divorced her and he lusted after his brother's wife. And his brother's wife is Hadidius, if I'm getting it right, okay? And she divorced her husband and the two of them married. But the thing about it was, okay, not only were they divorced, this woman was actually Herod's niece. So there was a lot of incest and adultery and all of this was going on in the family, okay? And John the Baptist being John the Baptist, he was, he was the greatest man that ever lived. And when he seen Herod, he would confront his sin because he was a leader, a ruler in Galilee. And he says, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He says, what you're doing is sin. And he came against them. And Herod's wife was fearful, right? First of all, she was offended. She hated John the Baptist. She hated him because he represented truth. And they were fearful because John the Baptist had such a strong influence and people would come out from everywhere to listen to him. And they were fearful that the Jews would rise up and come against them and get them out of power. So what did Herod do? He got John the Baptist and he put him in prison and he locked him up and he put him in prison. But listen to this. I need you to hear this. John the Baptist would have been in prison probably for about a year. And it tells us in the scriptures, it says, it says this. It says, Herod feared John and he protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly perplexed and disturbed in his soul. Yet he listened to him gladly. And so what would happen is, is that Herod would take John from the prison and bring him before him. And John would speak the word and speak the word of God and speak God's truth. And Herod would listen intently. And Herod would be disturbed in his soul. And he would be perplexed, the Bible says. And it also tells us that Herod did many things. Meaning that maybe as the truth was going now, Herod, he was disturbed in his soul, but maybe he went out and he did many good works to try and ease his conscience. But the thing about it was, even though John the Baptist was speaking the word of God, Herod kept saying no. And Herod wouldn't turn away from his sin. He kept saying no. And John the Baptist was like a comfort to Herod. And it's like that for many people. Jesus is like a comfort. They like having Jesus around. They like going to church and having Jesus being preached. But they get offended when their sin is confronted because they're not willing to turn away from their wicked ways. Do you get me what I'm saying? So he kept on refusing the word of God. He kept saying no to the word of God. He wouldn't turn from his sin. And the amazing thing about the Lord our God is this. Herod was exceedingly wicked. He was infected. He was a sick individual. Okay? A sick individual. He married his niece. Sick individual. And yet God's grace was reaching out to him. And God still loved Herod. 
And he was still true John, reaching out with his words of truth, hoping that John the Baptist would be convicted and would be willing to turn from his sin and follow God. But because Herod loved his position, and because Herod was all about ambition, and because Herod was all about power and influence, it was too much for him to give up. The Bible says, if a man, what does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Herod was unwilling. And we see then at a drunken party, let me tell you this, if you keep saying no to the word of God, if you keep on saying no to what God is telling you to do, what happens is your heart becomes hardened. And what will happen is sin gives birth to sin. And sin will bring you places that you do not want to go, let me tell you. And it will keep, or keep you longer than you ever want to stay. And what happened was there was a drunken orgy, this drunken party. It was his birthday. And he took out his niece's daughter. Her name was Salam Salamone, okay? And she was only a young teenager. And so she danced before Herod and all of his men. And this was usually only prostitutes that would do this thing or the lowliest of servants, not the royal's daughter, okay? Stepdaughter. And so she began to do this seductive dance and Herod offered her half of the kingdom. And Herod was rash with his words. And he says, ask what you want and I'll give it to you. And she ran to the mother because the mother had orchestrated everything and says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so what happened was, that's exactly what happened. Executioners came and they got John the Baptist's head and they brought it before Herod. But the thing about this was Herod was exceedingly sorry. He was grieved. He had to do this. He didn't want to kill John the Baptist. He really didn't want to kill John the Baptist. And he was grieved in his heart. But do you know what? That didn't stop him from doing it because he feared of what other people thought about him. He feared and he didn't want to lose face and he didn't want to lose his position. You don't hear about Herod then until you read Luke 23. And let me read uh, Luke 23, verse 6. Now, let me read this to you. Okay, hang on a second. Are you all with me? Okay, hang on, I have to find it now. So Luke 23, now listen to this. Now there's a lesson to be learned in this, okay? And it says this. Now when Pilate heard of Galilee, heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean, talking about Jesus. This was at Jesus' trial, okay? And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's juris jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time. Now, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he desired to see him for a long time, because he had heard many things about him, and he had hoped to see some miracles done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but Jesus answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod and his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been enemies with one another. Sin hardens your heart. Herod was jumping for joy. He was so excited to see Jesus. And he wanted to see Jesus because he wanted to see some miracle. He wanted to ask Jesus questions. He wanted secret knowledge. We know that Herod was into the, the black art, so to speak, and he wanted all this secret knowledge. He wanted answers. He wanted to see signs and miracles. He'd heard everything about Jesus. Remember, he would have heard about him way back when his father 
had tried to kill the children. He'd heard, he'd seen, he'd heard about all the miracles, all the wonders that Jesus has raised people, raised people from the dead. And he was so excited. And Jesus stood in his presence and he said nothing. The time of grace had passed Herod by. There was nothing more to be said to Herod. You see, sin will harden your heart. And when Herod didn't get what he wanted from Jesus, he stood vehemently. And the Bible says they screamed abuse and screamed in the face of Jesus. And they slapped him and they mocked him. And Herod would have stood there looking at Jesus and saying, that's it. That's what all the fuss is about. This is the man that everybody is talking about. Remember, Jesus had nothing about him that was attractive. Do you know what I mean? Like, he was despised and rejected by man mankind, acquainted with sorrows. And he was disappointed with Jesus, and Jesus just stood there and he opened not a word. The time of Herod's grace had passed them by. What I'm trying to say is this. There's many people that are putting off until tomorrow what they need to do today. There's many people, young people especially, they say, well, I want to still live my life and do things my way, and maybe on my deathbed I'll get right with Jesus. Sin hardens your heart, even on your deathbed. Your heart, just like that man I talked about earlier on, your sin is hardened, and you will turn your face away. Don't treat the grace of God as a license to sin. Don't abuse the grace of God. It tells us that as Christians, that we have been bought for with the precious blood of the Lamb. It cost God everything for your salvation. It cost Jesus his life. And it wasn't any ordinary death on a cross. Remember that. It wasn't just any ordinary death. Jesus was sinless. He took the sins of the world upon himself. He suffered the wrath of God so that you and I can have eternal life. And this eternal life, there's a cost to it. There's a cost to following Jesus. And it means that you've got to turn You've got to come out from the shadows. You've got to stop treating this as like it's some kind of a game. You're not just coming to church to see signs, wonders, and miracles and to hear a great preach and pray for me, top me up, make me feel good and go out well, and then just go back into sin. You're being deceived. And if your life was taken from you, you won't be getting in because it tells us in the word of God, whoever practices fornication... And let me tell you, that's sex outside of marriage. Whoever lies, whoever cheats, whoever is greedy, whoever is a homosexual, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Take that up with Jesus, not me. I'm so grieved because... There's people in this room and you are playing around with God. And it's a joke for you. This is serious. This is about your soul. This is about eternity. And you don't know if you have tomorrow, let me tell you. You don't know if you have tonight. And you can't play around with God. And it tells us this, I always say, there's two kingdoms, darkness and light. And all of us was in the kingdom of darkness and Jesus is standing and he says, your name, come out, come out of the darkness. Let me tell you this, he doesn't run after you. He doesn't plead with you. He asks you, do you believe? Come out and follow me. Touch no unclean thing and then you will be my sons and my daughters and I will be a father to you. 
We, the prison door has been opened. There's no point in sitting in the darkness, listening to the message, feeling all great. You've got to get up on your feet and you've got to walk this walk. You've got to walk in the newness of life and you've got to follow Jesus, who is the light of the world. Amen? You've got to follow him. You've got to follow him. You've got to follow him. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Now listen to this. In Ezekiel 33, 31, 32, God had raised up Ezekiel the prophet and he had told him to go into a wicked generation and to speak the word of God to them, to speak the truth. And this is what God says. This is what God says. And I really feel that this is the modern day church. I'm not, I'm not just saying it about people just here. I'm talking about the church worldwide, right? And it says this, my people come to you. He's talking to the preacher. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of much love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. They hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. My people come to you as they usually do. You see, the thing about it is we're creatures of habit and we can do religion very well and we can come to church every Sunday and do it very well. They listen to your words, they delight in what you say, but they do not put it in to practice. Another story of a man, um, Felix, and it's in Acts 24. I'm not going to read the whole story, but the Apostle Paul was in prison uh, for preaching the gospel, um, and he was brought before the governor, Felix, and when he would speak the truth, Felix, the Bible says, was intrigued. And Paul was in that prison for two years. And Felix and his wife, who was a Jew, Drusilla, they would bring Paul before them. And they loved to hear about the resurrection. They loved to hear about the word and what Jesus had done and everything else like that. But he wouldn't turn from his sin. He liked to listen. But he wouldn't put it into practice. And he left. He ended up leaving the Apostle Paul in prison. Another one was King Agrippa. Agrippa, Herod, or yeah, Agrippa. And when Paul would speak the truth to him, he believed in the prophets, the Bible says. He was another one. He married his sister. There was a lot of incest going on in the, in the Herod community, right? But he, he, he ended up, he ended up um, when Paul would, would speak to him, Paul said to him, I know you believe. Oh, I know, Agrippa, that you believe in the prophets. And I know, Agrippa, that you know what I'm saying is true. And Agrippa says, enough of that, enough of that. You're almost convincing me to be a Christian. He didn't want to live his sin. He liked to listen, but he wouldn't put it into practice. This is what Jesus said. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock and rain came down and streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because its foundation was built on the rock. But if anyone hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, he is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell down and the streams rose up and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. What are you building your life upon? Who were you in this story? Who were you in this story, if you get me what I'm saying? Are you one who listens? Are you one who's religious? Or are you one 
that's building your life upon a rock? What does the world see when you're at work or when you're with your family? What do they see? Do they see somebody whose heart is for Jesus and who is striving to please him? Are you truly saved? Are you truly saved? How do you know if you're truly saved? How do you know if your heart isn't being deceived? How do you know? Well, first of all, I'll just run through a few little things. Do you understand and believe the gospel? Do you? Do you really believe the gospel? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? Do you realize and believe that it is a free gift and that it is only by grace that you are saved? It says, for grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by work so no man can boast. Now that scripture has been abused over and over again. Yes, you're saved by grace, but now you've got to get up and walk in the grace of God. Amen? Do you believe that? Do you acknowledge that Jesus, Jesus as your Lord, do you acknowledge him? Not just as your savior, but as your Lord. Do you understand that you no longer live for yourself, but for him who rose from the dead? Your life, this is the gospel by the way, this is the gospel. Your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. You now belong to him. You now belong to him. The Bible says your life is now hidden in Christ. And you can feel some of the people all of the time. What's that saying? Some of the time. Some of the time but not all of the time. But you will never fool the Lord. The Bible says our hearts are bare before him. He knows our thoughts before we think them. He knows what we're going to do throughout the day before we even get up out of bed. Everything is revealed in the light of God's presence. And one day, you will stand before him and give an account of how you lived your life. You won't be standing with me. I won't be standing with Hammy. We're on our own. You stand before God on your own and you have to give an account as a believer how you lived your life quickly want to say that there's two judgments there's the white throne judgment which is for all unbelievers that's the white throne judgment where books will be opened and everybody who ever lived will stand before god and let me tell you this there's no mercy there's no mercy at the white throne judgment Mercy is only found here in this age, not in the age to come. There's no mercy. There's no mercy at the white throne judgment. And the second judgment is the judgment of believers, and it's the judgment seat of Christ, where we will have to give an account for the works and the gifts and the way we've lived our lives. And every single one of us should be hoping to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You'll be saved, but if you don't build upon the rock and if everything is hay, stubble, straw and all of this, it'll all be burnt up and you yourself, the Bible says, will be scarcely saved. Do you get me what I'm saying? This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. Your life is not your own. Do you have a sense of freedom? You learn as a Christian to forgive and to love those who fought us. And we walk away from the sin that once easily entangled us. Now, that's not to say that we're perfect. We stumble and fall every single day, whether it's not in action, it's in our thoughts, it's in our attitudes, it's in our words. Okay? But we keep short accounts with the Lord. We're walking in the right direction. We're seeking to please him. We're seeking to fulfill um, uh, the call of God upon our lives. We're grieved when we sin. Let me tell you, if you're not grieving over your sin, you're deceived. 
If you just think you don't have to give an account, you're totally deceived. If you're not grieved over your sin, already your heart is hardened. And just like Herod on that day, you will mock and you will scoff. You'll end up doing it. You will end up mocking and scoffing the name of Jesus and shaking your fist up to him and blaming him for your problems instead of taking responsibility for your life. True repentance brings true transformation. It's not about acknowledging your sin. I know loads of people that do that. I know loads of people who confess their sin. It's not enough to weep over your sin and cry over your sin and say, what a filthy sinner I am. Repentance means turning, it's acknowledging, it's confessing, but it is turning away from your sin. And by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit who empowers us, we can now say no to all ungodliness. Amen. Amen. You love the truth. You love the truth. It's how you know you're saved. You love God's truth. You love his word. You love his word. You just can't get enough of the word of God. Now, I know there's some people and they have difficulty in reading, but so long as you're even listening, that's that's good because God sees. But you love the word of God. You honor the word of God. You treasure the word of God. You treasure it and you live your life to honor it how you know you're saved. Now, I'll finish with this. 1 John 2, 3. You have a love for the brethren, by the way. You love God's people, their family. And you love the fellowship. You love the fellowship of believers. There's something wrong when you don't like the fellowship of believers. There's something wrong when there's malice and hate in your heart towards your brother or sister. And this is what it says. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If somebody claims to, claims I know God, but doesn't obey his commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him by the way they live. This is how we know we are living in him. Those who say, who say they live in God should live their lives just as Jesus did. Now, Jesus was spotless. But how did Jesus live his life? In submission and in obedience to the Father's will. He didn't live for himself. He lived for the benefit of others. In submission to the Father's word, in submission to the Father's will. Jesus was famous for saying, not my will, but your will be done. I just feel this morning, it's time to stop playing games if you have. And it's time to weigh up the cost. And it's time to say, if Jesus is Lord, are you going to follow him? Are you going to willingly weigh the cost, lay down your life, pick up your cross and follow him? The Bible says there are many people in the valley of decision, many people. If God is God, and if you just said that you believe, if God is God, if Jesus is Lord, then get up, get up, rise to your feet and follow him and run this race to win. But if God is not God and you don't believe, it's better not to have tasted than having known and to walk away. Don't trample the blood of Jesus under your feet.